welcome to the May 16th Curriculum Evaluation Committee meeting. We are in the Nashua North boardroom. It is 6 p.m. Uh, we have an attendance. Uh, we'll call the roll. Reagan Lamphere? Here. Neil Claffey? Here. Jessica Brown is here, and we have a quorum. Also in attendance, we have Dr. Kimberly Sarfty um, and representatives from the Nashua School District ELL Department and um, also the Project Succeed program. So, um, if there are no, we have one new item on the agenda this evening, and it is an EL program um, update and a possible new program. Is Are there any um, objections to adding that to the agenda first? No. no. Seeing none, um, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Dr. Sarfi. Thank you so much for adding this to our agenda tonight. So I have been talking to our amazing EL, ELL teachers, and they have been advocating for some time for a curriculum for our English learners. I learned a couple of weeks ago that we have over 1,500 English language learners, and the curriculum line to support our 1,500 English language learners is $5,000 and it has been $5,000 for quite some time. Which brings us to tonight's item. Um, you'll see before you there is a very thoughtful write-up here that was, that was created by our amazing ELL teachers, and they're going to talk to us a little bit tonight about the curriculum that they are proposing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle Booten, who was also Teacher of the Year last year. <laughs> Yeah, I, could I just, because it says the update, ELL update, should I just give an update about the Department of Justice? Was that what? You can give an update with the agenda or in general, or you can also agenda. give us, um, it's up to you, guys. you can just move right in, whatever, is, if you want to give us oh, a little. Okay. It, and right. I think that'll be part of our patient too. I think she'll discuss the DOJ. All right, so Danielle. So we um, are in desperate need of some curriculum. Um, and one of the things that really was kind of steering our thinking was looking for some continuity um, for grades K to eight, um, because that transition from fifth to sixth grade, we found it's just really important that, you know, our students are kind of having some sort of continuity in the curriculum that they're using. So when we were looking at different curriculums, that's one of the important things that we were focused on. Um, also coming out of remote learning, we wanted to make sure that whatever we chose had both an in-class and out-of-class component so we can keep kind of building those um, digital literacy skills. And so I know you're probably all familiar with um, English learners, but we're talking about students who have qualified for additional support during their school day um, based upon the fact that they are multilingual. So we have some students that speak two languages at home, we have some that speak four or five, um, depending upon the situation. Um, there's all sorts of procedures and protocols that we follow each time a new student enters. Um, there's paperwork that's part of their registration packet um, called the Home Language Survey, and that really guides the process to start. Um, once we have that paper, we then follow up often with the family, either with interpreters or if we're able to ourselves, just kind of getting a sense of what the language profile is in the home um, before we make the determination as to whether or not screening for um, ELL is appropriate. Um, once we give them that screener, um, they receive a composite score, um, and they also receive four domain scores. So typically for grades at least one through eight, they get a listening, speaking, reading, and writing score. Our kindergartners um, usually in the fall only participate in listening and speaking since they're just emerging in their, their literacy skills. Um, so that top part of the table you see kind of just breaks down the table of their, uh, breaks down the proficiency level based upon their scores. And then of course the lower the score, the more support they're going to need, the less English proficiency they have. And that also equates to more service from us that they're going to need. Um, many of our schools use a variety of models. So we do some pull out where students are coming into our classroom and receiving direct instruction. And there are also cases where going into classrooms and kind of working with the classroom teachers um, to kind of support within the classroom. Danielle's going to talk a little bit about the curriculum that the team has chosen. And I do want to point out that this certainly was a, a team approach. One of the things that we wanted to make sure that we were doing is we wanted to make sure that we were 
that we were adding on to um, what students and enhancing the experience that students are getting in their, their core classroom. We didn't want to do something that was separate um, and that wasn't aligned with what they're doing in their core classroom. So again, the team was really thoughtful about looking at all of the individual units to make sure that they could provide double exposure to background knowledge and vocabulary for our English learners. And one of the things that Danielle will talk about in a second is how this really is an asset-based curriculum. We are very excited and we're very fortunate to have English learners, or not necessarily just English learners, but students who speak multiple languages in our school district. It certainly is an asset, and we wanted to make sure to capitalize on that asset. So Danielle, can you talk a little bit about the curriculum that the team has chosen? Yeah, certainly. So one of the things I think a common misnomer with um, ELs is that when they have limited language, um, sometimes the, the content tends to get watered down and so we forget that they're a fifth or sixth grader, let's say, that may have a lot of background knowledge in their you know, home language. They may have gone to school in another country for many years. So they're coming with all of these, these skills and this vocabulary in their, L1, in their first language. And so we wanna make sure that any curriculum that we pick, we're keeping the rigor and the academic vocabulary at that same level so that we're backfilling the English language but we're also continuing to challenge them and help them to transfer the skills from what they may already know. And so when we were looking at the different curriculums, I would say that was probably the biggest selling point on this particular one um, is that it really focuses not just on building the basic, you know, vocabulary that they may need, but it also makes connections to math, science, social studies, um, the arts, um, so it's really helping them to build words, you know, and build vocabulary and concepts across, you know, their entire day. Um, it will also make collaboration between us and classroom teachers, I think, a lot easier because you're going in with a common ground. It's all stuff they're already learning in the classroom. We'll also have flexibility that we can look at the scope and sequences for the different grade levels and kind of rearrange our units so that we're supporting, you know, if they're doing fairy tales in the classroom in third grade, then, you know, in October, then we'll make sure that that's the unit we're pulling in ELL so that we're, you know, we're lockstep, which isn't something that we've necessarily been able to do um, to this caliber before. I think it will also help us to show um, just, you know, lots of, especially PLCs in our, when we meet with our grade levels to really kind of help start to, um, help kind of teach them more about like if you have an ELL at level one, you know, these are things that they could be doing as part of this unit in their classroom. You know, if you have a level two or three, these are things that they could be doing. Um, whereas sometimes I think some, it can be confusing, you know, you have a lot of kids in your classroom may not know naturally where they're at, but this I think will help to really foster those conversations. Um, I'd just like to add too, and that's that really, blends really nicely with some of these points that Danielle has highlighted on the sheet that you have before you. So in terms of the DOJ, the DOJ guidance and what we are required to do as a district, uh, the DOJ settlement talks about how Nashua School District has a responsibility to ensure that all English learners can meaningfully participate in their grade level core content instruction. And certainly that's what we are attempting to do with this. Um, additionally, the DOJ settlement talks about how the Nashua School District will provide adequate resources and instructional materials. And again, that's another point that we're trying to head on with this curriculum. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about in terms of the timing of this is that is that Danielle is able to secure professional development for our teachers K through eight in June. Um, the teachers requested having the professional development before summer starts because like all teachers, they wanna be able to plan and spend time thinking about it and then spend time thinking about how they can align what they're doing with these units uh, with what's happening in the classroom. So I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, any of our teachers in terms of the timing. No, I agree. I, we would love to have the training before summer because we will be able to have a lot more time to look at it, become familiar with it, and like you said, align it with what we know the classroom standards are and what they're doing throughout the year. The possibility of this um, 
Oh, sorry, Diane. Um, I was gonna say the possibility of the purchase um, has also kind of like energized, I would say, the department. There's a lot of excitement, K to eight, um, a lot, of, especially around like maybe finding time over the summer to work together to create, you know, units. Some of our teachers are the only ELL teacher in their building. Others have a team, so this would allow us department-wide to really like plan together and put some of these units together. I think it's important that, um, and some of the schools, like I teach K through five at Sunset Heights, and so I have to be able to have time to meet with the teachers in each grade level so that we can um, align it so the timing would be perfect. Do you have any questions about the curriculum? Um, I was wondering how this compares to what you're using now. It sounds like it's this, is there a comparison? Well, like I said earlier, for 1,500 students, the budget is $5,000. So there is no set curriculum that teachers are using. They're piecemealing things together. They're finding resources online. They're finding things from teacher paid teachers. They're making up materials themselves. And this would allow them to focus much more on instruction and focus on what's going on with the students who are in front of them versus trying to scramble and, and put things together. Um, where would the funding come from? Excuse me? Where will the funding come from? Is so, it from? Yep. So the funding would come from ESSER 3. Thanks. Um, so we're asking for three different curricula. Um, one would be called Get Ready, and it would be primarily for the first year newcomers. And it would be used from can, uh, first grade through eighth grade. So there would be continuity within that. And then the second program is called Connect that we would use um, from kindergarten to sixth grade. And that would be for students um, that are kind of between like a level two all the way up until they are able to demonstrate proficiency. And then the third um, program is called Bridges and would be used with our seventh and eighth graders. All three of them are by uh, Vista Learning. So it's all the same publisher. Um, they all were written in a similar manner. The books are set up in a similar way. The way that the lessons are kind of, you know, given um, is consistent. The activities that they do is also consistent. Um, there's a wonderful super site that allows the teachers to kind of log in and assign things, uh, practice and stuff that kids could do either at home or in their classrooms. And then we're able to look back at that data to see how it can inform our instruction better. Um, one of my favorite parts, and this is very rare, um, is that the licenses are for six years. So we put a student on a license in kindergarten and they're covered through sixth grade. That like n never happens. <laughs> um, and if that student moves, that's okay. You reassign that license to another student. I can promise you that absolutely never ever happens. <laughs> um, a lot of times with these programs, once you give the license, you don't get it back, that's it. Um, so the, just to be able to have that flexibility, I think it's a, is gonna be great for us um, because our populations do tend to move a lot, around a lot. That's a very common, experience for many of our students. So um, that also drew us to this program. One of the things I just wanna highlight really quickly is, um, so you see the grand total here and you get sticker shock, right? But if you divide that by 1,500 students and um, our six year license, really what that costs is about $28 per student per year for the six years. I was just gonna say another thing that I really like about this curriculum is um, with the online super site, there's a lot of opportunity for students to practice their speaking skills um, on computers, which is something that's rare and we've like struggled in how to do that effectively. And as we know, the, the, um, the access test they take every year has a speaking component and speaking is very important for our students. So that's one of the things I really appreciate about this um, curriculum as well. Yes, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, where it says, um, get ready sale practice books, is that for the teachers? Uh, so the practice books are for the students. For the so students. that's the only consumable um, within the program. Um, however, all of those papers are also available online, so we're able to print them out once the workbooks run out. Um, and then they're also relatively inexpensive. It's about $200 for a set of 10. So. 
in the grand scheme of things with our $5,000 budget, I think we'll be okay. Because the reason I'm asking is because there's 1,500 students, depending how many in each grade, you're only getting a pack of 10. So um, that's why I'm, I'm asking this. Would each student, how many students wouldn't have it and you'd have to print the papers up yeah, just do, do in each grade level? Yeah, so this will be primarily for K to eight. Um, mm -hmm. The high school program is not actually um, in print yet. Um, but for this initial order, we they actually comped us the workbooks um, for the majority of the students. So every student will have their own workbook to answer your question. Yeah, I understand this K through eight. I understand the high school was separate. Yeah. That's why I was asking if you have a pack of 10 and how many students that we have to make sure that we have enough books yep. for so, them because you wouldn't in a pack of 10. Yeah, we, did, we put on there. Um, enough packs to cover what we needed in each grade. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Go ahead, Dr. Mr. Claffey. Um, have you um, spoke with any other districts that have had success with this program? Um, not directly with the districts. I've spoken with the rep quite a bit um, and some of the districts um, are similar to us. So. Um, there's that. And then there's also, I think one of the big things is Vista, the company that creates these programs, they actually have um, English language development specialist ELL teachers writing this curriculum. What we often find is it's ELA teachers that are writing the curriculum. So many times, like the other programs that we looked at weren't written by ELL teachers for ELL students. They were written kind of more for the regular, you know, reading literacy class and then they tried to adapt it for ELL. Can I ask a follow-up? So I've been trying to find reviews of their materials online and I've only been able to find, it seems to be uh, reviews of their high school and college materials, but the reviews are and critical is an understatement. I mean, they're, they're average, they have 70 reviews, their average rating for the materials that seem to be for high school and college is one out of five. So my understanding is their high school um, isn't out yet. The new, the one that correlates to the programs that we're asking for is being developed right now. Um, there was also, I don't know if the research got to you guys, um, but there were a couple of articles that um, we were, we did receive on Friday. If not, I can make sure I email them. Yeah, so I, ha I haven't um, shared the research yet, but I certainly can do that. So that was one of the things that I did ask for. I wanted to be able to see the, re the research that backs up this program. I will tell you us, I will tell you us, um, somebody who wrote an entire dissertation and spent five years studying dual immersion, the, the research that is cited for this particular program does fall on the same research that I, that I um, brought into my own research. Uh, yes, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Um, how come this was given out tonight and not Friday? So everybody, whether you're on the committee or not, had a chance to review it because some of us do come in even if we're not on the committee? Yep, so uh, the reason why is we were initially going to bring this to June 20th, but because of the fact that um, they can secure professional development prior to that time, I spoke with Danielle, I think on Friday, and then I, I was hoping that we could have a walk on item today. I did email Jessica, but I didn't provide this information to her because Danielle was um, writing this up over the weekend. I think I did forward it to you, yeah. Yes, I, I, um, yeah, we did, um, as a committee, decide that we were going to take the item up this evening. Um, because I just want to say I have to follow up on Mr. Claffey because I like to do my research. Also, to see, get the reviews out there, the pros, the cons. Um, if people are, you know, schools are happy with this program because I'd hate to jump into something and we don't know if there's any bad reviews. But, you know, I get it's your committee, but still getting it the night of something this important for um, members, and even if you're not a, on the committee and you're not an alternate, not to be able to review it makes it a little tough. Yeah. No, I, I completely understand. I really do, and I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> I will just say that, you know, our, our ELL teachers 
have been researching for this entire year uh, the program that they think would be best suited for their students. I know that they don't take their I know they don't take this this lightly and they wanted to make sure because they know it's a big ask. They wanted to make sure that the program that they used with their students would be um, best suited for them and also help them to employ best practices and, and be grounded in research. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Danielle. Yeah, I was just going to say, so we've looked at probably six different programs um, this year. We've gotten samples for them. We've talked to reps. We've had Zoom meetings with them. And when we get down to the hard questions and, you know, who are the experts that they're citing and, you know, what's at the base of their curriculum, none of them have the, the depth that Connect and uh, Bridges and Get Ready can offer. Um, we also had at Ledge Street, Kayla and I and our team, um, we had some Title I money available that we were able to repurpose. And so we were able to purchase a small sampling of it for a couple of grade levels. And we've actually been piloting it um, with a number of our student groups since January. Um, and it has been, I would say, honestly, a game changer. It has really helped us um, be more cohesive as a team in our planning. It's given us um, a variety of data points to look at. Um, we're seeing amazing um, growth within our students. Um, we're using a program called ESCI um, so that we're able to do pre, mid, and post assessments to track the growth the students are making um, with their vocabulary. Um, there's an increase in their oral language, their computer skills, their digital literacy, um, their ability to use the sentence frames that we are, it's very systematic in the way that the sentence frames are kind of um, taught. And so we're seeing the students are able to utilize those, you know, both in their, their mainstream classroom as well as with us. Um, so we certainly wouldn't be here today if we weren't confident that this is exactly what our department um, needs. Um, you, oh, go ahead, Mr. Laffey. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned the Better Business Bureau also has a list of reviews. And again, I'm, it's not a, they're not reviewing the materials, they're reviewing the company and the average score there is one out of five. And they're talking more about communication, responsiveness, the, the company itself. I don't know. Is, is that Vista Higher Learning that you're looking at? I hope so. Yes, Vista, Vista Higher Learning. Okay, so what's the difference between this? So, Mr. Claffey, I, I appreciate you looking into all that, and we'll try to find any kind of reviews we can and share that with you as we move along. Well, um, it's for everybody's good. Um, so we'll, we'll do a little bit more research in that area. And Sorry. yep, the Boston, the better business, did I say Boston business first time. <laughs> it's the Better Business Bureau. Yep. They do they do uh, list the address for this company, and it's the same address right. on their proposal. So, right. I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just concerned. And we'll, I mean, we'll gather information specific to the program that we're proposing tonight. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, first, the, during your pilot, um, did you observe if there was, this provided more in-classroom time for the students as opposed to time out in their ELL classes? Uh, so per the DOJ agreement, they have to be out of their classroom for a certain amount of time. That's part of the agreement that was settled upon last spring. Okay. Um, so that's kind so of that, non-negotiable. So that, really that wasn't non-negotiable. It was yeah. non-negotiable. And but do you feel like do you feel like they're having a better experience with their regular classroom understanding um, as opposed to previously? Absolutely. So like our first graders, for example, in their classroom just finished a unit on community, um, and so we were able to pull that unit and go all the way back to like community helpers. What does it mean to be a part of a community? What are the different types of communities? What does it mean to be? in a community and really kind of pre-teach some of the more common language, but then also teach them the academic language that they were then able to participate in their classrooms for those lessons in a different way than they had been prior. And, and to that point, Ms. Brown, this is one of the reasons that the teachers enjoy this program so much is that it is tied so tightly to what's going on in the classroom. So it's not kind of like we're taking kids out, teaching them something different and putting them back in. It's just there's a the collaboration of the content, yeah. which is really attractive to us. I, th I mean, I think that's an ideal situation so that you have that cohesiveness going on. Um, do we have enough staff to implement this program? This seems like a pretty tall order. 
Well, we've uh, we've been working on that. But yeah, we we haven't we have those empty positions that we're looking to fill. But uh, as we gain more, th hopefully throughout this summer, um, it'll it'll increase our capabilities to service the students completely with the program. Okay, and um, I guess my final question is. Um, I mean, I do think that the breakdown when you look at the spending per student um, annually is very is very reasonable um, and important. Uh, but I'd be, I'd be curious to know, and I think that the, and I would also like to hear that you can the licenses are transferable, as you know, with most software programs, that's very rare. Um, is how frequently do you have students move from the um, emerging to developing, and then I guess eventually moving into traditional classroom model so that's, a, that's a really good question and that was one of the things we were really concerned about um, because sometimes you have a newcomer that comes in and it may take them for the majority of the year to work through that first year curriculum but then other times you'll have a student come in and within two or three months they can fly through it and then you're able to you know move on to something else and so we didn't want to be stuck in this get ready newcomer book all year if a student didn't need that and so um, this program does allow us to transfer them in and out of curriculums with ease um, so students will basically be in them as long as needed. And that's part of the, um, the data that we're collecting. That's what we're using it for, to kind of determine, like in a school like Ledge Street, we have, I mean, our fourth grade, we have 44 fourth grade EL students. So there are many groups of fourth graders. So we're constantly kind of moving. It's very flexible grouping. So every six to eight weeks as kids need to, we're able to just, you know, shuffle their groups so that they're in the, the, the grouping that makes the most sense for their needs. I do like that. It seems like you can kind of individualize the plan for the students, which is the goal ultimately. Um, okay, uh, anyone else have any follow-up questions? Uh, so um, is the committee comfortable with um, taking a vote on this tonight? Do you feel like you need to have more research? I would be comfortable with it, but I, I'm not sure about everybody else. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll send it to the full board, and in the meantime, we'll find out more about this company, so I am. All right, okay, so um, I guess I'd be looking, do you want this, since this is three curriculum, would you like this in one motion or three? One motion is fine. Okay, um, so I'd be looking for a motion to um, enter into an agreement with Vista? Yep. Right. Um, with Vista in an amount not to exceed $257,917.50 uh, to be paid for out of ESSER three grant funding. I'll make that motion. Okay. And I'll second it. We'll give Ms. Lampier a moment. Um, so just with the motion on the floor, I think the entire committee would appreciate it if you could maybe give us a little bit more research between now and the board meeting. So probably go to the board on Monday. Um, so that would be great if we could get that little follow-up info. We will do so. All right, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, so now we will continue with the next item on our agenda, which is an update from the Boys and Girls Club on Project Succeed. So we have uh, three new guests with us this evening who have joined us before. And just when you speak in the microphone, if you just, um, your first time you speak, just introduce yourself. That would be wonderful. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Janiel Archer. I work for the Boys and Girls Club as a senior director for Clubhouse Operations and Quality Programming, and I have served as one of the lead staff for uh, Project Succeed. And I'm Casey Castor. I'm the executive director at the Youth Council. Uh, we're one of the partners of Project Succeed and provide the social emotional uh, learning aspect of, um, of the program. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll follow along. Did everyone get a copy of this as well um, at your desk, at your seats? <laughs> yeah, sure, great, go ahead, introduce. And I'm uh, Craig Fitzgerald. I'm the executive director at the uh, Boys and Girls Club. Could I get a copy that you put out to everybody? Uh, so um, we, became, we came before the board in November um, with the suggestion of uh, starting this program. Previously, the Youth Council had housed uh, the Suspension Center for the middle school, um, and with the need uh, being raised by the, both the middle school and the high school administrators um, to help deal with behavioral issues that were coming up in the schools, uh, we partnered, our agencies partnered with the, uh, the school district to, to develop Project Succeed. Um, the approach is um, really this sort of multi-organization um, program that, that would leverage kind of the space that the boys and girls had to be able to house up to 20 students from the middle school and 20 high school students uh, per day and the social emotional aspect that the youth council offers. So we've got uh, an embedded um, mental health counselor that provides um, both assessments of students and also group support for them. So this uh, particular slide goes over a day in the life of a Project Succeed student from start until they continue back into their traditional school setting. Um, their day essentially begins with, uh, actually uh, all students who attend Project Succeed are referred to the program by a administrator from the Nashua School District. Um, initially we started out accepting students who were suspended due to a number of different uh, reasons from uh, physical acting out um, skipping classes, uh, low performance in school. Um, so all students come with a referral so that Project uh, Succeed staff can assess to ensure that they are um, a good fit for the program um, and so that we can meet the needs of each individual student. Um, when the students are um, arriving to the program, they start by taking their normal transportation to school, whether they walk to school or they take a yellow school bus to school, a uh, Boys and Girls Club van or bus um, attends all of the middle schools and high schools to pick up the students at the beginning of their school day. They are immediately brought to the Boys and Girls Club where they are provided a hot breakfast, and then they go to their respective classrooms for their academic support. Each student, or each classroom, the high school uh, classroom as well as the middle school classroom is provided an academic support professional um, to ensure that the uh, students are provided academic support while they were, are with Project Succeed. All students have access to Chromebooks or desktops while they are at Project Succeed so that they can hop onto the Google Classroom and um, continue any work, any school work that's assigned to them. Um, during the academic uh, support period that typically runs from about 7.30 in the morning till about 11.30 in the morning, which then we um, venture into lunchtime. Uh, but during the academic support time frame, students are provided the social emotional support as well, where the counselor goes to each classroom and they might pull out a student one-on-one -on -one, um, for a needs assessment to as assess the behavior that led to the student being referred to Project Succeed, but then also going into um, um, some personal stuff about what might be happening in the school setting or the home setting that could attribute to some of the behaviors that the student is exhibiting. Um, additionally, the counselor is also providing group counseling as well. Um, and some of the sessions that uh, the topics that he goes over ranges anywhere from bullying to substance use to positive topics like um, effective communication, uh, problem solving, um, to ensure that the students not only addressing the specific behaviors that resulted in their referral, but are also planting uh, coping skills and different mechanisms to allow them to process and navigate through 
any situations that might arise when they return back to school. Um, students are provided with a hot lunch, um, and then after lunch, they go back to their classroom, and then they transition back, uh, or they transition into youth development um, time, where they are uh, matched with the Boys and Girls Club staff member, and then they are able to uh, take advantage of some of the um, youth development focused programs that we have at the Boys and Girls Club, ranging from cultural arts to athletics to social recreation. Um, the purpose in that is to give them an opportunity to engage with a positive, caring mentor, but also to encourage them to have healthy relationships with their peers um, in a school-like setting. <clears throat> and then, um, at the end of the day, the students are returned back to their school setting, um, either uh, by the Boys and Girls Club um, transportation so that they can catch a ride home, or some, in some instances, parents do pick up their students at the end of their Project Succeed day. Um, every single student who is referred to Project Succeed is given a free membership to the Boys and Girls Club so that they, uh, so we encourage the child to remain engaged in a positive um, program. Um, their membership for the Boys and Girls Club remains for the entire school year as well as summer programming, and we encourage students to take advantage of that, and many do, where our Boys and Girls Club is open until 8 p.m. We provide a hot dinner as well, um, so just really combating food insecurity and making sure that um, all of our students and club members are afforded opportunities and resources that they need to be successful. Um, in addition, to, excuse me, in addition to um, group mentoring and one-on-one -on -one mentoring. They have access to um, intentional programming at the Boys and Girls Club that falls under uh, encouraging leadership, academic success, and healthy lifestyles. Um, and then when a student is returning back to uh, their traditional school setting, a needs assessment is written by the social emotional counselor at Project Succeed to again go over the initial reason for the, the recommendation or the referral for the student to attend Project Succeed, to go over um, the, the successes or challenges that might have arised during the one on one and group sessions, and then to also outline suggestions and recommendations for the student to be um, continuously supported when they do uh, return to the school setting. Uh, and a, a, the follow-on um, support for the students when they get back to the school, um, it starts with the student assistance program counselors. So part of the project or part of this program actually allowed us to um, make sure that we had a student assistance counselor at each school. So in the past, we had one at each high school and then we had one um, dividing time between the middle schools. Um, with the follow-on care, the, the needs assessment really um, outlines kind of, as, as Janelle was saying, some of the, um, the factors that the, the counselor at the uh, suspension center is really seeing as uh, you know potential for referrals, either ongoing uh, counseling support. Um, in a lot of cases, we're seeing uh, you know family dynamics being being an issue that the counselor is providing a needs assessment to um, all of the school administration, uh, but also the counselor at the schools on how they can continue to support the family. So um, all of the needs assessments are sent to the uh, assistant principal who who is kind of overseeing the suspension, the guidance counselor that's assigned to the student, uh, our student assistance program counselors, and also um, any IEP coordinator or uh, any special educator that works with the students. Um, that way we're able to ensure that we have a, you know, a comprehensive understanding and really can work together as a team to support the student when they get back into the school. Uh, the way that the student assistance program works um, is that the counselor will meet with the student, go over the needs assessment with them, and really talk to them about these are some of the things that were identified during your time at the at Project Succeed that we'd like to help support you with. Um, the students are are given the option to obviously to participate in the program, um, and we're we're finding that the majority of students are are interested in in following up with the program. Um, also, uh, the the entire social emotional aspect is optional for the family. So a parent can choose at the time of entering the program to opt out of having the counselor meet with the student during the program. Uh, and also uh, there's there's response with the families at the time that the student returns to see if they wanna continue with um, the student assistance program. So the piece is um, generally that, that support is um, short, it's considered short-term intervention. So um, meetings, if the student participates in the student assistance program, are 
anywhere from uh, one to three sessions, and then um, it can be ongoing while the, the uh, student assistance counselor is helping the youth to, to make those referrals. So if um, intensive therapy is needed uh, and the student doesn't have access to a, a therapist, we're referring uh, out and working with the family to connect with Greater Nashville Mental Health um, with some of the other providers in the area. And there are some waiting periods for those, those services, and so our counselors are able to be there for the students in the school until they're able to transition into a, a more long-term program. Uh, so we're really seeing a, a good amount of success with that. And we're also, you know, as, as we talked about during the presentation about developing the program, continually trying to sort of assess how things are going and look at how um, we can improve the process. So even within the last couple of weeks, we've talked about um, you know, there, there's re-entry meetings among school staff, usually when the kids come back, um, but better incorporating both our counselor from the suspension center and also um, the counselors in the schools into those meetings and, and discussing what they're seeing in the Project Succeed program and, and ensuring that the administration can ask questions of the counselors as well. So that's, you know, constantly changing, but really we're, we're improving the process of kind of communicating that information and then working as a team to support the students when they return. And just highlighting the communication, we do uh, meet weekly with the school district to talk about the challenges or successes um, each week, um, in addition to speaking to the students' teachers one-on-one, -on -one, as well as special education professionals. Um, we have um, just last week spoke with a, a special education professional who was working on kind of um, identifying um, what services need to take place in the school uh, to support the student when they return from Project Succeed. So uh, communication has been exceptional um, between Project Succeed and the Nashua School District, making sure that we're solution focused and supporting any student that is referred to us. Um, so we have had this program up and running. Our first day for the program was uh, February 14th. Aside from uh, two school vacations, we have um, been in the program for a strong 10 weeks. Uh, last week has, was a very um, monumental week for us as we did surpass 100 students served, which is, um, it's, it's really great um, to see that all of these students and parents who are providing the parental consent see the importance of this program. So just to kind of break down the numbers, um, as of Friday afternoon, we had 101 students referred to us. Since we've had about five more students um, through Friday evening and today be referred to Project Succeed. Just breaking down the numbers, 68% of those students are in high school and 32% come from middle school. Um, 82 students who um, of the 101 referred have actually attended Project Succeed, leading, um, having us at 81% um, attendance. A concern of ours when we first started was uh, how do we get students to not purposefully get in trouble um, so that they can be at Project Succeed instead of school. Um, and I'm really proud of the numbers that we have where of the uh, 101 students and the 82 have attended, only 13 of those 82 students received a second suspension. And of the 13 who received a second suspension, only four of them have received a third suspension. Um, and when we do have students who are, are you know, hitting those numbers where we have four students, that just encourages us to increase the communication with the Nashua School District so we can address what other uh, situations are arising that is continuing to um, cause this child to be referred to Project Succeed. Um, 77 of the students who have attended Project Succeed have been screened for mental health and substance use risk factors. Um, towards the right of the, of the slide, it, it breaks down some of the different uh, causes for students to be referred to Project Succeed. Um, so what, the first one is inappropriate contact, and most of, most of the time that's just touching without consent. Um, High-risk behaviors is just an excess of the negative behaviors. Um, substance use, vaping, using uh, opioids or having drug paraphernalia, acting out, whether it's at home or at school, throwing objects, fighting, um, mental health, and that can range from uh, depression, grief, um, anger, anything that would um, present as a barrier for the child for the child and being successful in school. And then uh, poor, 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 
poor performance and poor attendance, a lot of that is, um, you know, low grades are, are class skipping. There's a lot of class skipping that we're seeing. And then any other um, situations that might not fall under those main categories. Um, as we had mentioned before, we have the capacity of taking uh, 20 middle school students um, and 20 uh, high school students. So it ranges um, for the length of suspension from three days all the way up until um, you know 10 days. We've had some students with us longer than 10 days. And in situations like that, we do have uh, communication with the school district who then has their own internal meetings to assess uh, what other services need to be put into place to support this student. Um, and then we we do have some students that have a modified school schedule where they start school in their traditional school setting. They come to the um, Project Succeed for um, access to, to the social emotional services and then they are and then receive uh, some academic support and then in the middle of the day they're transferred back to school so that they can uh, complete the rest of their school day there. But that in that one particular situation, the uh, special education department is highly involved with that one student. And then uh, this last page um, goes over just some, some quotes and some positive feedback that we've received from Project Succeed. The first one is from jo uh, Joy Paul, where she's a Nashua School District case manager, and she just highlights um, the importance of the program and, and how she um, had a great experience working with us with one of her students that was assigned to her. And she highlights the communication, um, our ability to to be flexible um, and support students despite having a, a different makeup of students every single day. Um, the next quote comes from a guardian. Her name is Monet. She talks highly about her her nephew's success in a short period of time that he had been with Project Succeed. Um, she recognized um, an immense transformation in his demeanor and the way that he carried himself, especially the way that he carried himself at home uh, and his likeliness to speak up about how he was feeling instead of bottling it in. Uh, Magdalena Bain, she's a grandparent of a student and she just expresses her gratitude uh, for having a program like this. And it's a program where we're not addressing the students in a punitive manner, but we're meeting them where they're at. Um, we are talking with them instead of at them um, to just see what their needs are, um, what the family needs are. Uh, I communicate a lot with parents and guardians and caretakers just to make sure that if there's any other concerns, we're addressing those um, as well. Um, and then we also have um, a student that Casey can talk more about uh, where he was with Project Succeed from the start, um, even before um, we took over as um, a multi-organizational partnership, um, she had a student in Project Succeed, or I'm sorry, she had a student in her suspension program at the Youth Council, and he eventually transitioned to Project Succeed, and if you wanna share a little bit about that. Yeah, that's just a, a, a great story to highlight. Um, Russell Schrichtel, our, our counselor that works at the uh, at Project Succeed, was planning to be here tonight, and he had to go home um, sick, but you know, from from us seeing him, Russell actually, uh, actually met with him when he came to to uh, what was the suspension center at the youth council? Um, very close to, you know, it was sometime in January. Um, he he was uh, had been suspended several several times um, and had at that point was um, on a indefinite suspension while he was being evaluated for a number of different things. Um, and when he started to attend the program with us, um, you know, we saw that he was very withdrawn. Um, very, it was very tough to get him to come. Uh, his his uh, dad couldn't get him to get up in the morning to come to the program. Um, you know, he met with, with Russell and, and we did the needs assessment. Um, and, you know, we saw while he was working with us um, that, you know, he, he really, was lacking in confidence and lacking in motivation because he'd fallen so far behind in his classes and was feeling that there really wasn't a great way for him to catch up. Uh, the, the, pro the program transitioned while he was on suspension uh, to, to Project Succeed. Um, and from there, uh, the, the difference that, that um, he made in the time since uh, February until uh, just last week, I think it was last week or the week before he went back to school, um, was remarkable. Um, he, he worked, he went from being very resistant to doing work and, you know, not even like, f not feeling like he could even catch up, so why bother? Um, and, and not, not, 
showing up on time to uh, working with the staff there to be able to, to be on time to start to catch up. And I, I believe he went back um, and is, you know, back to grade level, is, is doing well, um, and started throughout the time that he was also at Project Succeed uh, participating in the support groups and really opening up about what the issues were that he was dealing with and getting a lot of support on that and getting a lot of um, just guidance and, and, you know, folks who understood uh, what he was going through and when he was sent, uh, you know, finally transitioned back into school, um, our, our counselor, Russell, um, you know, communicated with the school staff to let them know that the kid that left the school um, was not the same kid that was coming back. And really, uh, I think that that's been another key piece of it is uh, the communication between the, the program and the staff to communicate with them both what the kids are going through, but also um, you know, letting them know ways that they can be supportive when the, when the student comes back. And so uh, we've really worked hard to make sure that um, as the students transition back that they're, they're not feeling like they're just starting back over um, with the same you know, issues that they had before they left the school. Um, so to see this student uh, and, the, and the progress that he made both, you know, before um, the, the Project Succeed started to now has been um, incredible and, and very, um, very much a testament to the work that the, that the staff, that the academic tutors, that Janiel uh, and Russell are doing uh, to help bring the students back to, to where they can uh, be productive in class. We also have um, another student, this is my last story, but it's one that moved me a couple of weeks ago. Student was referred to Project Succeed and prior to um, attending Project Succeed this school year, he had missed 70 school days um, and he had been attending Project Succeed uh, consistently, engaging with his academic support professional um, and has since um, on his way to passing a, a few of his classes, which is huge considering that he had missed a significant amount of school. Um, and in a one-on-one -on -one conversation that I had with the student, he shared with me, um, I, would sh I would swap shared for, he advocated um, his, desire, his desire to stay with Project Succeed a little bit longer so that he could maintain the work that was being done. He didn't want to go back to school and not feel ready and, and um, fall behind again. Uh, but then he also shared in a one-on-one -on -one that prior to him moving to New Hampshire, he lived in Florida with his mother and he had a behavioral IEP and he was advocating that he feels that he needs a behavioral IEP so that he could be successful in New Hampshire while he's living with his grandmother. So there's a lot of information that's shared with Russell, with myself or with some of our other um, Project Succeed staff where we are relaying up and we're reporting out to the school district to advocate for the children. But a lot of it is self-led advocation from the, the students. And um, when I had approached the student, I said, hey, well, what about having one more week at Project Succeed so that you can continue this work? His face lit up. This is a kid prior to this conversation. He'd have a hood on, he'd keep his head down. And even in that one sentence, he was like, oh my goodness, Janelle, I'm so excited that you offer that because I actually wanted to ask you if I could do another week so that I can continue the work. Um, so it's, it's moving to be able to communicate with the, the students and give them a fresh, um, just a fresh outlook on their own academic success and to hear them advocate for their own needs um, is it's really powerful. So, um, you know, that concludes our presentation for you guys, but I do want to just express my gratitude for you guys taking a chance on this program because we are working together collabor collaboratively to, to change these students' lives. Are there any questions? Any questions? Anyone, any questions? I just had a comment. All right, go ahead. Um, I ran into a former student, and she doesn't have a background in education. I think it was in finance, but she started teaching or tutoring at your school when it opened. You know who I'm talking about? No, you don't. And she, man, oh man, she loves it, and she said she's found her calling. Um, boy, she couldn't say enough good things about how much she loves working there. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> hearing um, your story is, just, is um, oh my God, it's amazing. And I'm so happy for these kids that they've, they see a future ahead of them, ahead now. So that's great. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Question, when you were saying the students were f so far behind, now how did you get them caught up that quick where they're only in a certain time frame? Is it the one-on-one -on -one tutoring? 
I really do think it is the one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Um, and with uh, Project Succeed, we, again, we really try to meet the students where, where they're at um, instead of, you know, just attacking them the minute they come through the door with, you need to cl um, complete these assignments, but you know, what are you understanding so far? What don't you understand? And then a lot of it uh, is dependent on the communication with the, the teachers and the guidance counselors and, and the, the principals and the APs. Um, but I think the smaller um, ratios help significantly. Um, and then having it be kind of like a wraparound where it's not just us doing the work, but it's also in partnership with the school district. Um, the, the students are get, getting that continuity of, of care and, and support. Uh, but I think the, the ratios has a lot to do with it. So if you have a student that's that far behind, what would you say the average time is um, with you versus sending them back to their school? Uh, when he originally started, this particular student, um, it started with a 10-day uh, suspension. And then from there, I would uh, communicate weekly with the, the AP and some of the teachers. What are your thoughts about him staying another week? Okay, he did really, really great this week. Our, um, our academic support professionals are great with sending like a wrap up of, here's a list of all the assignments that the student has completed. Um, just ensuring that the, the teachers are seeing in real time the work that's being done. Um, but also assessing like what else needs to be completed for the student to pass this class and just you know breaking it down so it's not as overwhelming. Um, for the students to, to address. But uh, again, a lot of it falls on communication and teamwork from Project Succeed in the school district. Thank you. Like, and I don't know if you can compare the two, but Russell, who, you know, Casey mentioned earlier, you know, we're learning from each other. You know, what makes this collaboration successful is we all bring different skill sets and backgrounds. I mean, Casey and the Youth Council and Russell, they have amazing, you know, knowledge when it comes to social emotional wellness. You know, Kimberly and, and Bob Chopra are on the ground. They understand, you know, the needs and the wants of the teachers and the support that they need. And then from a youth development perspective and a facility perspective, we're able to, but Russell said something really interesting that resonated with me is we have to meet the students where they're at. And I think that was like an aha moment for the group is that if a student has five assignments and they only do two, there's a decision that we have to make is, is do we hound on the fact that they didn't do three or do we praise them for the two that they did do because they used to do zero. And so what's really allowed us to make progress is, is meeting them where they're at and praising their successes. What that does is it fosters a trusting relationship. And then the next time they'll do three. And then the next time they'll do four. We may not ever get to five, but four is a lot better than zero. And so I think forward progression is the goal. I mean, we have to meet students where they're at, at the pace that they're willing to move forward. Um, understanding that no child and no student is alike, so. Thank you. I, um... I appreciate what's going on, what you guys are doing here. I think it's fantastic to hear um, about the individualized supports, the wraparound supports, um, the confidence building of um, getting those kids feeling like they can succeed or can be ready to work in um, a regular classroom and also advocating for themselves and the help they need. It's, it's just good to hear these success stories already. Um, I'd like to make sure that a copy of this program gets into the board packet if possible so that other the community can see it online um, because it's great results. And also the fact that you have kids asking to come back to the program who the number, it looks like the number one, one of the number one issues a lot of these students are having is very poor attendance in a traditional setting. Um, at 47 percent, and the fact that you have kids showing up every day and getting progressively better, it's a first step, so that's great. Um, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add? No? All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Feels good to have something that it's also working so quickly. I, I mean, I just feel like we just talked about this and started it and already we're seeing results and that, that feels good. Just a few months ago, I will just add to that Heather Raymond happened to be at the Boys and Girls Club for another reason and she was able to tour um, totally impromptu and she saw the kids and how hard, incredibly hard they were working and I think she was really impressed by what she saw. So it's good uh, that's a question. Can us board members get a tour? 
Okay, if you can arrange it maybe with the administration, because it would be nice for us to be able to get in there and see exactly how it's working and seeing the students that we're sending over. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, next we have Amplify Science. Um, so I think we have another presentation. So while Mrs. Tino is getting ready, I will just say, so this year we fully implemented grade five, Amplify Science, and I will say that Monica has completely led that charge. She's absolutely unbelievable. If you saw the materials that she's created for teachers, I mean, you'd just be incredibly impressed. I think she might show some of those materials today. Um, she's also going to talk about how we kind of did a soft rollout for grade the grade four curriculum, and that was completely voluntary, and when she talked talks a little bit about how many teachers have volunteered to, um, to implement grade four this year, and then also how many teachers attended the full in-service day, professional development day. And again, this is for teachers who were not required to teach this program. I think you'll be incredibly impressed. And um, we're also going to talk a little bit about our plan for full implementation of grades three and four. And I also want to remind the committee that Amplify is the science curriculum that we use at the middle school as well. So take it away, Monica. There we go. It's deceiving. Um, so we're teaching the next generation science standards. Um, with the science standards, these, these science standards in particular that came out, um, you might have heard a little bit about them. They're not, they don't just tell us what to teach in science. It's a huge shift with these standards and it tells us how to teach science as well. So it's kind of been a huge shift. Personally for me as a teacher who's been teaching for a while, um, it was a huge shift for me in my practice. Um, but it's also really rewarding teaching with the next generation science standards. So we needed a resource um, to help us out. Um, the resource helps us to teach with the next generation science standards. And Amplify Science is the only resource that has gotten the green light from Ed Reports for K to eight. Um, there is no other curriculum, and they've looked at a lot of other resources, and none of them gotten the green light, but Amplify Science has. So we're very fortunate to have it right now. We're, we're using it five to eight in our district. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of um, explain this as kind of a journey teaching NGSS. If you've taught science before and now you have to teach with these standards, it is kind of a journey. It's like, how are you changing your practice with it? Um, from my own experience, writing your own units is very, very difficult. So we're very fortunate to have such a high quality resource like Amplify to help us on that journey. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out, and I point this out to teachers too, um, in my practice is that we're kind of right now using the resource and we're teaching with the next generation science standards. So we're doing both at the same time. A lot, sometimes when we think about the change in the pedagogy and how we're teaching, it's really about the standards and not about the resource. So that's kind of a big um, idea that I just wanted to kind of share with you. A lot of times when we're looking at how the change and the shift is, it's because of the standards and not the resource. Um, so a lot of times with the new standards um, and the way that we have to teach, it seems really, really slow. And that's what the picture's there for. Um, it seems like it's going so slow. And the reason why is because with the Next Generation Science Standards, they used a lot of research about um, our brain and how we learn. And so um, with the Next Generation Science Standards, we learn in progressions, and Amplify Science really helps us with that. This is an example of what we call a progress build in a fourth grade unit um, called energy conversions. And so you see there the progress build number one. There's a number of lessons, probably five to, um, five to 10 lessons, that help the students build their understanding of this first progress build. Students understand that devices work 
work by converting electrical energy to another form. So you see the lamp there. The, electric, the, the electricity comes in, and the students model this by drawing it, because they, you know, they really figure things out when they draw it and model. And so you see the electricity coming in. That device changes it so that it's light energy. And we talk about a lot of other devices, too. But the whole point of this unit is to um, be able to explain how the electrical system works. And so this is what we have to make sure that they understand first. They, they've had a, a number of lessons, and now we are at this progress build one. Then, as we move down to progress build two, they're building upon what they already learned. So there are a set of lessons now in which they start to understand well where does the electricity come from? You need a source of that energy, and you need some kind of converter, a source converter, to change that energy into electricity. Then we have a number of lesson sets after that, and then the students add more to their learning. You can see it squeezed in there in the middle, the wires. Well, if you have a source of energy, you have the source converter that changes it to electricity, how does it get to the devices in our houses? And there you have the wires. So this is just an example of this progress build that students, how students are learning in science to be able to see this big picture, how does the electrical system work. And when we're doing this, we're doing a lot of hands-on activities, right? The research shows, everybody knows, hands-on science is not only fun, but it's a great way for students to learn because of how our brains work. Um, but I, I do want to kind of point out there that hands-on doesn't necessarily mean minds-on. So sometimes we might be doing an activity where we're learning about the life cycle of a butterfly, for example. If we then take a moment to make paper, um, butterflies with tissue paper and paper and um, clothes pins, that's no longer instruction, that's enrichment. We're enriching our, our curricula, we're enriching our lessons, which is a wonderful thing, but that hands-on experience is not part of the instruction. And that's a big thing to think about. So when we're only looking at instruction in our resource, our resource gives us all of that instruction and we can add enrichment to it. Um, as we see fit. So to kind of illustrate this point a little bit further, this is an example of a really fun activity. During remote learning, we, I tried it with a bunch of classes, um, and I couldn't get it to work, but the kids did. Um, I don't know, it was a matter of my paper towel or something. And But so really fun activity, right? So we can do this activity, and then I can say to the kids, well, this, the reason why this happened is because of capillary action, and I can give them the definition and tell them. That's really an enrichment activity for them because it's kind of like you can, you can think of it as like going to a science center and you learn about all the different skeletal systems of all the birds, the prey around here. That's a one-shot deal. You're learning some really great information. You might retain it. You might not, you know. But if I were to take this lesson instead and say, well, what do you think's happening? And the kids started talking and thinking and probably asking a lot of questions. I said, well, kind of draw out what do you think's happening? Like, what exactly is the water molecules doing in there? This would take a real lot of time for them to figure it out, and they would have a real understanding of capillary action in which they could then take that and use it in other experiences in their lives. So that's what we call science instruction, and that's how the NGSS works, and that's how Amplify helps us to teach that way, because you can imagine putting together a unit like that would be, you know, a, an incredible feat. Oops, I went right past, it was just a, me saying yay, because I love science instruction. Um, so to give you an update on fifth grade science, I don't know. Um, so year one was last year during the, um, our almost full year of remote learning. The teachers got lesson by lesson supports. I made lesson videos, and that's a picture of a slide with me in the corner there. I made lesson videos for all the students um, and teachers, and the students had interactive slides that I um, adapted from the Amplify resource. And so the students were able to go in and kind of put their own drawings or drag things so that they weren't just watching a video with their class or on their own. So we implemented all of the units um, in the first year last year in fifth grade. 
This is year two for fifth grade where um, we received the supply kits. And this is an example of all the supply kits for one teacher for fifth grade. There's um, really great bins that they come in and um, really great hands-on materials for them to use. The, all of the kits come with enough materials for three classes. So each teacher gets a kit and it lasts for three years. And then after that, the only thing that you have to um, purchase are consumable things like, for example, um, in fifth grade, one of the things that we would have to buy is flour for them, for some of their um, experiments. Um, and during year two, during the summer before year two, the teachers also had professional learning opportunities that were online um, at their own pace with videos and such for them to um, participate in if they chose. This is an example of the lesson supports that I provide for the teachers this year. These were, I also use these for remote learning, but this year they're updated for in-person learning. So this is um, accessible on their Google Classroom. We have a fifth grade science Google Classroom. And so this one document here is all the information for one lesson that they get. I basically take all the things from um, Amplify, put them in one convenient spot, and I also add um, some things to it that help enhance the um, resource, because Amplify is just a resource. It's not something that we um, um, have to use exactly, right? So we're adding a couple things here and there to it. For example, a driving question board to get the kids really engaged in the questions that they have about the unit. Um, so you see there they have um, their lesson at a glance with time frames. Sometimes I provide a video if it's something I want to show them or it's easier to talk about than to write. Um, I also give them the lesson slides that I've adapted with teacher notes. They have all the things they need for the classroom wall, what it should look like at that point, what vocabulary cards they need to pull out of their kits for that day. Um, whether or not they need a computer, um, the Amplify materials have books each in, in elementary school. They all have um, between five and six books that the kids read. And they're also, I put the attachments there, they're also read alouds in English and in Spanish for them. So the links are just right there, just easy for them to grab. The notebook pages with answer keys that I create, um, any lesson notes that I have, teacher resources that, that I created, and then a big shout out to the assessment. Um, most of the lessons in Amplify do have assess, some kind of formative assessment. Um, what to look for with your kids to see how they're progressing towards that progress build. So um, these are available right now on the Google Classroom for all fifth grade teachers um, for every single lesson that they teach all year. Um, they also have professional development available to them on my um, science website. They have um, these, the top three right there are three courses that are on Google Classrooms that they can um, take at their own pace how they want to. Then I have professional development for each unit, so like an introduction and kind of the pedagogy, like this is why we do this in the first lesson, um, you know, what it's called and why we're doing it, some guidance on grading, on science discourse, on writing explanations. So all of that is found on the website. So teachers do have that constant PD that they can be looking at again at their own pace, which is really nice. This summer, um, fifth grade teachers have available to them an NGSS refresher workshop. Um, in integrating ELA and science workshop, there's a lot of um, ELA standards that are covered in our um, science program. So for example, writing, reading um, non nonfiction text. Um, and so we're providing a workshop for that. Using assessment and Amplify, Amplify Science is going to come at the end of June um, and do a workshop for uh, three to five and six to eight. And then again, those non, um, those asynchronous workshops. So year three is next year. The thing that we're going to add for for fifth grade teachers is um, team coaching cycles. So I'm hoping to meet with fifth grade teams and talk about productive science talk, how to get kids talking in your class and working towards them figuring out things on their own and kind of their coming to their understanding, which also really translates with our Eureka math program and the way students learn in math. So it's kind of double duty there. So those were our plans for year three. This year, we had four teachers volunteer to um, teach with the Amplify units. 
four teachers out of about 40, so about 10% of them, um, took us up on the offer, and Amplify provided the kits with all of the materials and the online access for them and all of their students um, for us, so that was really great. Um, I just wanted to pop out of this a minute and share with you a quick um, simulation. You've probably heard about the simulations in Amplify. They're absolutely amazing. If you want, I can show them all to you, but I did pick out the top one. <laughs> Just one of them. It was really hard to pick. So this one comes from a unit called Waves, Energy, and Information, and the whole phenomenon in it that kids look at is um, how a dolphin mom um, communicates underwater with their baby. And so they're really learning about sound waves. And so this... Um, this simulation is, um, and you know what, I, I, we probably didn't hook up the sound, let's see. Oh no. So it's playing the cello right now. And so you can see how you take something here that we can't normally see sound waves, but this simulation allows students to do that. So one of the things that they do with it, so they can change instruments oh, here. Right. Oh, maybe. I don't know if we hooked it up, that was the... Oh, no, you did it, Mr. Claffey. Okay, so that's the cello. Thank you. Um, and there are a couple other instruments. You can also take a, one of them and, and isolate it so you can watch what happens to it, which is neat too. And they use this for their investigation to figure things out. So I'm just gonna quickly show you how how they figure out something. So here we're gonna play around. They're learning about sound waves. That's the whole point of this unit. And so this is amplitude. So if you play around with the amplitude a little bit. What are you figuring out about amplitude? That it's about volume. Yeah, good. <laughs> so you can see using a, a simulation like this really helps students to be able to um, interact with something that they normally wouldn't be able to. And a lot of the concepts in science are like that. So um, they are excellent. It was, it was really hard to choose. They're excellent simulations. So our plans for third and fourth grade implementation, um, number one is to um, start off with a four hour workshop. We did this already successfully with a fourth grade on our February workshop day. Um, I think out of 40 teachers, 37 or 36 came voluntarily because it was Teacher cho cho Choice Day um, to the workshop. And so it was four hours of really looking at the first unit um, introducing the NGSS, the pedagogy of the NGSS, all of my resources that I have available to them. Um, and we plan to do that with the third grade too. We have it scheduled for June right now. Um, they'll have science kits with, again, consumables for three years um, to use with three separate classes. Lesson by lesson support on the Google Classroom, just like the fifth grade, they'll have um, lesson by lesson support. Um, the Science Professional Learning website. They also have the Summer Professional Learning Opportunities this summer. So even if they haven't started teaching um, with the Next Gen Science Standards and Amplify, they could still come to the refresher after the four hour workshop. Um, and definitely start, that's in August, so that'll get them really ready for to kick off the school year. Um, and of course, um, I'm the um, science coach, so there's science coaching available. And then in the future, um, maybe in the springtime, if we have some third and fourth grade teachers that are really gung-ho, or maybe they're just really gonna look at their, you know, their, their units for the first time next year. The following year, just like with the fifth grade teams, start looking at some team coaching cycles. So we can, they've been introduced to, for example, productive science talk, now we can really kind of hone in on it a little bit. 
Um, and of course, we're, we're looking at um, science instruction. We're looking at a science program. So how are we going to measure and keep track of how students are doing? So we do have a plan for that as well. Um, so this is K to eight science assessments. We'll be looking at collecting data um, using Aspen um, and using uh, Amplify Science. They also do a lot of the analytics on their own, which gives teachers quick feedback, which is really great. So at the end of their instructional units, they'll take their um, assessment and Amplify offers a really great rubric for them to really look at the three dimensions of science instruction and be able to assess their students. We'll collect that data as a district, um, but they, to see how the students are doing, but we'll also be able to add on teachers in, um, and teacher teams really look at that and see how can we change things to make it even better. Um, they are all summative assessments that we're gonna be collecting the data on and they are part of the lessons, so no additional time is needed, which I think is also a great thing. It's not like, okay, it's the end of the unit, now we need three extra days to, to assess our students. It's part of the units and part of the lessons. Um, so, I already mentioned this, so collecting data would be using our um, Aspen um, student management system and also using the Amplify Science platform and getting the data that way. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Yes, Mr. Claffey. I thought I'd go last, you know? No, no, no. Oh, um, so the... Uh, 40 uh, for grade, I'm looking at the big one. So the grade three kits, um, you're ordering 40. What is, how does that? I had the same question. Is it, is that 40 classrooms worth or is that 40 kids worth? Is that what you're asking? Oh, uh, it's classrooms. That's what I figured. Yeah. So, yeah. but if you don't get the buy-in from the grade four teachers, right? Because I think you said three. Do you expect every teacher to participate? Yes. So it, w it would be a district expectation. Oh, no choice. They'd have to, well. Well, it would be our core science curriculum. But again, what Monica highlighted, Monica, I don't want to, what were the numbers again of teachers who voluntarily spent an entire day learning about this? I did hear that. Yeah, I think it was 36 or 37 out of 40. It was all but about I think three teachers that came, but again, it was it was a choice day, and the teachers had the choice of what to do. And their building might have had something that you know really was building pertaining, so they didn't come. I, I was yeah, I was very um, you know humbled by the fact that that many people came, so I was pretty excited. And you obviously love it. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, uh, I have a couple questions about the minutia here. Um, the books, are they available in hard copy or only online? The books come, so for um, for K to five, they offer books for all of the, the units and they come in hard copies. For K to two, which we don't have yet, um, but we did pilot a few years back, so I still have that kit that Amplify gave to us. They have the big, huge book for the teacher and then they have the little books for the students. So all the students have a hard copy to look at. Somebody yeah. hold on to. So they're, it's part of the kits. Okay, excellent. Um, and then my next question was about the consumables. Um, so, you know, when you're kind of still learning, probably in that first year, maybe you, if it's, oh, if it's three years worth of materials, <laughs> I'm guessing maybe the teachers and the students maybe use more than they should in that first year. Is there a way to replenish that or have you seen that happen so far that we're running out as it gets close to year three? So they say three years. So the plan right now is I've already started collecting data from teachers and also going just through the lessons myself on what needs to be replaced so that we can start thinking about that next school year and next school year's budget. So, they, so that would really bring them to two. Um, okay, so that, that's what's, I mean, when you yeah. implement a new thing, it's kind of, you got to work it out a little bit before you figure out exactly how to. Right, um, so far everything at the, um, like at the fifth grade and the fourth grade units that I've looked at are things like vegetable oil and flour and sugar and salt. So it's, they're not like big ticket items, they're just con small consumable things. So consumables, but not curriculum materials, correct? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, and so when we make the purchase of um, the kits at, 
I guess the total price, you know, 40 kits, uh, it looks like $4,000 per kit approximately. Um, that one kit will last three years and then we'll have to buy, in three years from now, we'll have to buy the entire new kit again or just the consumables? Just the, just the consumables. So just the flour, the oil, the st that thing, that stuff. Um, and as far as the uh, kind of online um, uh, Access that the, the access. Um, are they updating those regularly, or is it kind of like it stays consistent? As what's the average amount of time when they update the actual um, experiences online? Um, so they're constantly updating. Um, they're definitely a computer um, company, um, software company. They do things right away. So like sometimes I'll send them an email and I'll say, you know, right here, it, you know, it says this and it should say this and they fix it right away. So it's everything's done right away that way. But they do have new things coming out. For example, they're launching in, in September an interactive um, online experience for just the elementary grades. And then they're hoping to do it for the middle grades afterwards. So that could be something that we, um, you know, would might ask for in the future, but it's um, just kind of an upgrade to what we have now. It's not a new program. Or right, and that's, I guess, that would be my follow-up to that is, generally, would those kind of updates be included in the fee, or would that have to, would you have to pay an add-on? I you? think it depends what it, you know, what it is. I'm not really sure. Okay, um, and, I guess my only other thing was the sticker shock at the shipper, shipping and handling. Holy cow. Um, if I had one complaint, I'd, hello, Amazon, what? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, it, seems, it seems like a good program. I, um, it's obviously that you find joy in teaching it, and so I'm sure that reflects in the children too. And as long as we can stay up on top of it from a budgetary standpoint moving forward, uh, making sure it gets into the operations budget because it could be, the cost could add up down the line, it sounds like, for updating. Um, yeah, go ahead. I we have a question, Madam Chair. So the 40 kits per classroom, right? No, I mean, so I'm, one, one kit, kit per classroom. 40? We have about, in the elementary level, we have about 40 teachers per grade level, give or take. So the, the classroom kit, there are 40 of those, and then does each student get an individual thing? Does it work that way? Or no. I was just, I mean, I just, if you estimate 20 students per class, that's about $172 per student, which is the you know price of a textbook easily, right? Mm -hmm. So 172, does that seem like a reasonable estimate per kid? 20 students per class? Might be a little bit smaller. But, but I mean, this is for even more students because it, it really doesn't matter how many kids you have in your class with the teacher kit, except for the consumable materials, everything else, there's enough books for everybody. You know, you'd have a class of 35, still have enough books. Wow. So. Yes, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. Um, I did a little homework um, and just looked at reviews from parents, and they said they liked it. There was mixed reviews, but they felt that there was too much time on the computer, not enough hands-on. That's what I was reading on the reviews on Amplify. How do we address parents if they feel that there's too much computer time? So um, I guess I understand maybe where some parents are coming from in other districts regarding that, because they might be giving the students the lessons. Amplify does did provide over um, remote learning last year, videos that you could just push out to your kids and they do it all on their own and they're still available. So that might be still be being used, but it's not a lot of computer time when you teach it the correct way. They do have lesson slides, which are great. They help keep you on track. They help, um, you know, with figures and that kind of stuff. But the kids only need to be on the computers when they're in elementary school. Well, I'll say three to five, when they are using a simulation, so they're actively engaged and trying to figure something out, like with that sound one, um, or um, 
that's it for elementary, or if they're or if they're listening to a book instead of reading the hard the hard book if they're listening to it. In middle school, they're on the computer a tiny bit more, and that's because they have the option of putting their um, writing into the Amplify program, um, and then the teacher has access. It's kind of like the Google Classroom. So that's the only other thing. Um, some teachers could I could I could see where those reviews would come from if teachers gave their students the um, slides and so all the kids are sitting there on their slides while the teachers on their slides and going through the lesson but that's not really um, you know good practice for teachers to be doing um, and the hands-on so um, that was kind of part of my presentation. What I wanted to just kind of point out is that we can have a lot of hands-on things, but when we're talking about instruction, you have that one big hands-on thing and you're trying to you know, figure something out. And so it does take time for kids to figure things out and learn things deep enough to be able to then apply that to their general lives. And so we do need that time there. So. Do we want to enrich, could we enrich um, this a little bit more with some more enrichment? Sure, they could, you know, if they're doing something with butterflies, they can make butterflies and put them around the room and that just brings excitement to the kids and that's great, but it's not part of the instruction. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, just to kind of follow up on that, is you said that Amplified has their own um, tracking sort of with their assessments. Um, is there a way to know the frequency of use um, like after a year of teaching the curriculum, um, how frequently teachers are using the slides and videos and just handing that out as opposed to doing the hands-on and the interactive things, kind of like the demonstration here. Is there a way to, that we could know that, like how they're actually using it in the classroom moving forward? Um, so teachers are, so a typical Amplify lesson, I would, I would put the slides up and the first slide might say, okay, so let's think about this question. And we might have a discussion. And then the next slide says, okay, here are the directions for what we're gonna do next with the, so it has all of the directions on there. So that, so this, there are slides for every single lesson. Um, so we could, we could look like it, well, I don't even, I don't know, because Google has some analytics, so you could look and see who's using my slides, but they prop, most teachers will take, make a copy of my slides and use them. Um, so we wouldn't really see that. With the middle school level, you can look at usage a little bit more with students um, and how they're um, using the Amplify platform and how the teachers are, because they use it more than at the elementary level. I'm sorry, did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Okay. I was wondering what the reasoning was for starting with the fifth grade and then going back to the fourth and third. And I was wondering if you're hoping to do first and second at some point. So I can answer that. Um, so Amplify already exists at the middle school level. So we backtrack to grade five. And then when you talk about New Hampshire SAS, grade five is a testing grade. So that's one of the other reasons why we chose to start with grade five. Um, do we use Amplify in the middle schools now? Yes, yep. Oh, in the high school too? Just the middle schools. Okay. Yep. So the vision would be K to eight, ultimately. Um, I just want to highlight one more thing too. So obviously the slides are more guides for the teachers, and I, I definitely want to highlight the tremendous amount of work that Mrs. Tino has put into this. I mean, the videos that she created for remote learning, the lesson supports for teachers, the Google Classroom that she set up for teachers, and then just designing the professional development. And I, I just kind of want to make a plug for investing in our coaches. One of the things that we did approve earlier this year is coaching and training for our coaches. And you can see why. I mean, you know, these, these folks are absolutely invaluable. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that. I was actually, um, when you were talking, I was, I looked you up on here. I was like, wait a minute. She's a fifth grade teacher, but she's finding out all this stuff about, for all the teachers. So I, I was surprised that you were in here just as a teacher. I was like, she must be something else too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hope that you're enjoying coaching. I'm sorry? I hope that you're enjoying being a science coach as well as a teacher. Uh, yes, I love it. Any more questions from the committee? All right. So um, 
I will be looking for a motion to approve the Amplify Science curriculum as presented in amount not to exceed $349,000, one hundred, wait, I'm sorry, $349,152. Motion made by Mr. Claffey, I will second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion passes. Great job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Tino. So we have one more item on our agenda, and I'm sorry, two more items. Um, and we have the Middle School New Hampshire SAS historical results. All right, so here we go. So one of the things that Jonathan Foster, our data analyst, and I have been doing is looking at our performance data. Data. Wow. Sometimes you add an R when you're from Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> our performance data. What we decided to do was exclude last year's data because it certainly was not reliable. We had, or, or not last year's data, but 2020 data. That's obviously in the height of the pandemic. So uh, we excluded that data. And then if you look back at 2018 and sixth grade, specifically what I wanted to highlight is our reading data because I want to talk about bringing some um, reading professional development to our middle schools. So if you look back to 2018, 43% of our students in sixth grade were demonstrating proficiency in reading. And then unfortunately that went down to 40% in 2019. And then you can see where we're at right now. I mean, certainly we expected the numbers to decline last year in 2020 and in 2021 because a lot of students have unfinished learning as a result of the pandemic. But you can see that before that time, the data was not favorable. When we look at seventh grade, um, we can also see the decline, 49% demonstrated proficiency in 2018, 45% in 2019, and then you can see where we're at currently. And then in eighth grade, it's a similar trend, 42% um, in 2018, down to 37% in 2019, and then last year we were at 34%. So certainly when it comes to reading, when it comes to reading, we want our students to be able to demonstrate proficiency. We want them to be at grade level. Reading opens the door to all content areas, but also in every single profession that a, that a child will grow up to have. Um, reading is definitely essential. And so what I want to also highlight is that this is not for lack of effort on behalf of the teachers. I visit the middle schools and I see the teachers absolutely working their, their tails off and they are doing the very best that they can to serve our students. Um, one thing that we need to do a much better job of is making sure that we have high quality resources and professional developments, development rather, available to our teachers. I walked into one classroom and I knew right away what gray level the, the classroom was and one of the students asked me why and I said because that textbook and that story that you're reading that's the same textbook and the same story that I read when I was in your grade and then I looked at the copyright date of the book and it was 1980 and we're in 2022 we need to do better okay so that's what I'm trying to highlight right now um, at the elementary level to go back we brought in Teaching and Learning Alliance. We've been working with them all year. Teachers expressed at the elementary level, expressed a desire to have high quality professional development. And what I decided to do is just send out a little poll, a little survey. One thing I wanna highlight is that all of the professional development that has been attended has been optional PD and teachers are filling up the workshops every week that we have workshops. Uh, during the in-service days, same thing. Those, both of the sessions on our last in-service day were maxed out. 
So teachers are very hungry for professional development. And so I wanted to find out before I presented um, the proposal to bring TLA to the middle school, I wanted to find out what the feedback was from the elementary teachers. And so when I asked the elementary teachers, would you, re would you recommend TLA to a colleague, 88% of the respondents said yes. And Mr. Claffey, we had a much larger sample size this time. <laughs> we had a much larger sample size this time. Um, and then I also asked the elementary teachers if they want TLA to continue to offer professional development and 94% of the folks said yes. Um, just wanted to pull out a couple of the, the anecdotal comments that teachers shared. Uh, one of them says that Stephanie, she's one of the presenters, was one of the best workshop presenters that she's ever had the opportunity to learn from. Another teacher said that the presenters were very helpful, they answered questions, and they always try to make the most of the sessions. And then uh, yet another teacher said, I would love to have some opportunities to continue this during the summer when I have a little bit more time. And so we are taking care of the those needs at the elementary level. And what we also want to be able to do is um, take care of those needs at the middle school. Because as you can see from our data, there really is there really is a need. And again, I just want to highlight the fact that we have teachers who are working their absolute hardest and we need to do better to make sure that they have what they need so that they can meet the needs of every single student in their classroom. So what you have before you tonight is a proposal to bring TLA to our middle schools and um, to essentially have lab school sites at all three of our middle schools. And um, with the, the lab sites, it's, it's actually a wonderful opportunity because there is a lot of professional development that goes on. There is coaching from the TLA consultants. They will work, and I know because I participated in this as a teacher and as an administrator. They will work side by side with the teachers. They will teach with them. They will sit with them. They will plan with them. And they will most importantly listen to the feedback from our teachers. I hosted a, um, we're not having steering committee right now because, um, of work to rule, but I hosted an optional ELA steering me meeting probably about a month ago and I wanted to hear from our teachers, the, one, the ones who attended, and we did have a bunch of teachers who attended. I wanted to hear from them about what they were looking for with regard to professional development and curriculum at the secondary level. And really what they just said was, we wanna be heard, we know our kids, we want somebody who's a teacher who can listen to us and who can relate to us. Um, <clears throat> and we also want to be involved in the planning process. And so that's why we specifically sought out TLA because these folks are real teachers. They're, they're masters at their craft and they will um, be very responsive to the teachers but also will sit with them, like I said, and help to plan out units and then um, really focus on tier one instruction, which is that core instruction. And what I will say is, you know, these folks are all over the country, they're everywhere, they're based out of Massachusetts. Um, but when I called them to ask if they would come to Nashua, New Hampshire, they were really excited about it. They, they were not in New Hampshire, we're the only school district that they've been working with in New Hampshire. Um, and like I said, the feedback from the elementary folks has been overwhelmingly positive. So what I'd like, for, what I'd like to ask all of you tonight is to please approve this proposal to bring um, TLA to our middle schools to be able to host these lab sites, to be able to offer professional development for our teachers, and also to be able to offer workshops for our teachers so that they can plan. And then, um, you know, I will be asking probably in the future for some updated curriculum materials, probably novels and supplemental materials, um, because like I said, we need to do better for our teachers and for our kids. Does anyone have, does anyone have any questions? I was just, man, I was just, so um, 
the, I won't ask you how many people responded to the survey, and if you answer, if you said this, I'm sorry, I was reading about it. 116 uh, elementary teachers. So, you, so I was just curious, roughly how many teachers have participated in their sessions? That's it. Yeah, that, that's a great. You know what? I didn't add up all the teachers, and I'll tell you why. I really, I really am not sure because we've offered so many different workshops. Some teachers attend multiple, but we had 118 respondents out of the elementary group. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. So prior to 2020, in 2018 and 2019, we weren't proficient. Is that correct? That's correct. And so we have to eliminate 2020 because that was a year of hell. So now we're in 2021 and we're still not proficient. And in 2022, we don't know yet because we're just at the beginning. So. I know you were not here, so I can't put any heat on you. But prior to COVID, we weren't proficient. So do you have any data back to why we were, I wasn't on the board then? What program were we not using or what type of um, teaching method were we not using that this is gonna be so much better with the with the teachers that we're going to get our kids profession, proficient. Well, so what I would what I would say is this: um, this isn't necessarily a program of any sort. This isn't this doesn't involve, you know, like a, a can curriculum. This is focusing on core instruction from start to finish, and then also again sitting down with teachers and planning lessons that are aligned to the Common Core. I think that the focus on instruction, and I think the modeling of the consultants from TLA, and I think that um, you know sitting down as a collaborative group during the PLC time. That's one of the what's that's one of the benefits of being at the middle school right now is that there is embedded PLC time and being able to maximize that time, I do think that we're going to see a return on investment. Well what reading program are we using right now? So right now I'll I'll say that you know there's I there's a lot of different things that I see at the middle school level. I don't know that there is a core ELA program. And that, that is something that we want to, um, we want to change because we want to make sure that we have consistency. But again, in hearing from the teachers, they want to be part of building units. Well, I've always talked about consistency at the elementary level because one school might have a different program than the other one. And if you move within the district, you're not in the same program. And I guess, that we've had these, this isn't the first time we've been, we haven't been proficient. This has been going on for a long time with the proficiency in reading and even in math to a certain extent. That I find it very hard that the district at this point in time hasn't gotten their act together up until COVID um, because the numbers probably would have been just as bad even in 2020. But now they're worse because of the fact our students had to have remote learning that we haven't put anything together and be consistent throughout the district, have a reading program. And are we doing phonics in our program? Well, yeah, we have consistent structured phonics instruction K to three right now at the elementary level. K to three phonics. And the only reason we've got that, because when I was on the board the first time, we had whole language. And that whole language, I saw so many kids fail and have a a teacher say to me one day about one of my kids, oh, don't worry, Mrs. Johnson, the type of work your son's going to be in, they don't need to learn to spell. They'll have spell check. And I almost fell over with that because for the simple reason is that, you know, words can look the same, but the meaning is different. And whole language for our generation of around 40 and 39, probably down to 34, were the ones who really got killed with this whole language. And when I left, they were implementing phonics again because let's face it, when you come from another country, what's the first thing you start learning in English? Phonics, you have to. How do you pronounce how the sounds of the words? And so I guess this really knocks me over because we're probably no better than we were in the 90s and 2000s, the early 2000s. And yes, we should be doing, and it's no reflection on you because you just came in here. So I'll make that clear. But we should be doing a better job with the taxpayers' dollars. And 
being a taxpayer, I'm saying, well, where did my money go all these years if our students can't read, can't understand, and can't write? That's all part of this whole thing. So, thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Lamphere. Um, the difference in the proficiency level drop between the um, seventh grade and eighth grade and the sixth grade is really, it's really stunning. And it makes me wonder what the drop is for the kids that are younger than that in fifth, fourth, third grade, who lost so much time um, when they were just beginning to learn how to read. So I think it's really important that we take this seriously and do something, you know, big. Um, use, use the ESSER funds that we have to really make a difference for these kids because, um, you know, they, they're not going to get that time back. So the teachers that are working with them as they go through the system are going to have to really use their time well. Right. So, so yeah, I really, like, I really like this program. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so, the, I mean, the evidence is here. We, we've been, we were trending down since 2018, and quite honestly, probably before that. Um, and which I'm glad that we're being proactive in a really, or uh, active, actively searching a solution to do the best by our kids. I think that's good. Um, how, if we provide this professional development and this coaching. Um, how are we going to be sure, and are we, is there a way that we can follow up to be sure that they're consistently implementing this in, um, into our classrooms? I think um, Ms. Johnson did, and you may also made a good point about the consistency between the buildings, um, the three middle schools. Is it they're going to be, is it will it be district-wide or will it be pockets of success? Yeah, so a couple of things. The first thing is, you know, again, we're, we're going to be using the same PD provider, K to, to eight. And I think that's gonna be really helpful because, you know, we're, we're also going to have kind of debrief sessions with the consultants and talk to them about what they're seeing in our schools. And I think it will be helpful because we're gonna have folks who are in pretty much all of our buildings, K to eight. So that in itself is really helpful because if we know that we have some gaps in learning at the elementary level, or maybe there are even some gaps in teaching, you know, they can help to provide a window into that or, um, and they can help to inform their practice that way, but also the decisions that we make. But, um, now I've lost my, I'm sorry, Ms. Brown. It's, it's okay, uh, implementation and yeah. making sure that it's being used. So the other part of that is really making sure that we have, if you notice here, there is uh, there are two sessions for principals and district leaders. That's where I was going with this. I think it's really important to make sure that principals and district leaders are on board. I think we have to have a common understanding of what, high quality tier one instruction looks like. And, um, and I, you know, it's important for us to all engage as learners, all the leaders in the district, to make sure that we calibrate our understanding and that when we're looking in, we're walking into classrooms, we're all looking for similar things. And I think that's gonna be really important. I will say certainly at the elementary level, um, learning walks are a big part of this lab site um, model. And uh, that involves leadership, that involves teachers going into other teachers' classrooms, and really it's all for a meaningful professional development opportunity. There's, not, there's no sort of gotcha, there's no sort of um, punitive approach, it's all about growing as a, a teaching and learning community and just getting better at what we do. Um, that's excellent. Um, all right, so I guess I have a couple more um, follow-ups to this. Um, as far as academic rigor and materials, how are we, um, is that what you're talking about when you're talking about moving a, writing a program to move forward for like the entire district to work with um, so that we can really bring our, ex raise our expectations up a little bit higher? Absolutely. Or much higher? I, 
Much higher. <laughs> yeah, much higher, much higher. And what I'll say is, and then what does that look like? You know, certainly we have a diversity of learners in our district. We have students who are at all different levels. Um, we have different language proficiency levels. There's all, there are all kinds of things going on. And I'll say as a teacher, you know, that's, it's very daunting because you have all of these students in front of you and you're trying to figure out what is it that I need to do to get those kids from here to here. And this is every single student in my classroom. Um, and so that's really what I, that's what really what we want to focus on with TLE. But then additionally, like you're saying, we want to make sure that we are increasing the rigor. We want to make sure that text complexity is higher. We want to provide entry points for all students into more complex text. Um, and that's something that we want to do collaboratively because we've heard the secondary teachers loud and clear. They don't necessarily want us to just go and deliver a program to them and say, here, you know, make this work. They want to have a hand in kind of planning and figuring out what our resources are. But they can do that while being guided by people who understand the standards and understand the grade level expectations. Um, I'm glad that you're being thoughtful in that moving forward and w looking for collaboration. I do have one other concern about instituting this now. Is your plan to start these um, start this coaching now or through the summer or in the fall? So yes and yes and yes. <laughs> so I had, um, so I'll be honest, we had, we passed a, um, a proposal for the elementary level earlier in the year and we had some money left over. So, you know, naturally we kind of map out the spending, right? We had some money left over and um, based on the need at the middle school, we decided to reallocate those funds and then have TLE go in and perform needs assessments in our middle schools. And um, there certainly is a critical need there. And so we've started that work. We've started those conversations with some teachers, with principals now, like kind of preemptively. And then our goal is to, um, I have a, a EL, an ELA steering committee we're going to, uh, that's on the 23rd of May. We're going to focus solely on middle school ELA. Um, we're going to generate some support and hopefully get some people together over the summer so that we can sit down with them and plan and offer professional development so that we have something that's ready to go for the f for the fall or late summer, I guess I should say, um, and then we will kind of just go all in as soon as September hits. Um, thank you for working so hard. I I'm a little bit concerned that um, I actually wasn't aware that we were still under work to rule. I thought we were past that, and so I'm a little concerned that. Um, if we spend this money now and we start this process, that we won't actually have teachers that come and attend it. And I'm wondering if we are, if we should wait to make the investment until after we have people willing to come and take advantage of the service. Can I just respond real quickly, Madam yeah. Chair? Um, I thought I heard that the uh, work to rule was lifted once the agreement was made here. Retro pay. They're, the union that, is waiting for retro pay. And that's going through? Very shortly, very shortly. But what I will say is this, despite work to rule, again, I mean, you know, it's, it's a delicate situation, but I still have people showing up. Every week people are showing up. Um, they show up for these optional steering meetings, they show up for optional PD, they're coming after school, they, reading specialists come to optional meetings, they're, they're showing up, they really are, because I think they see the need and they, um, they want some help. I absolutely agree with you. I think the teachers, there's a lot of really dedicated teachers who will definitely step outside and make the commitment. Um, I just want to make sure we get the maximum value because this is another pretty large investment. Yeah, um, no, I, I completely understand. And we want to make sure, you know, we don't want to sit in a round, around in a room with five teachers. That's not going to help us, right? Like we want to get as much people to participate as possible. And I will say, you know, even with TLA, if we can't get folks to sign up and do the work with us, 
they're going to hold off because, you know, obviously their reputation means something to them and they, they want this to be a successful partnership. So if, if I come back to them, and that's one of the things that they have done with all of the workshops that we've offered, like the foundations workshops, the science of reading workshops, they always ask me how many people signed up. And if they don't think it's worth running, then they, you know, they don't want to waste their time or ours. And I definitely appreciate that. But I, but back to your question, Mr. Mr. Claffey, I think retropay is happening relatively soon, right? So this, I, I don't think that that's going to be a barrier in the summertime. Okay, can we guarantee that the plan is though not to hold one of these sessions with three people in the room? <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I, I definitely wouldn't, I would not do that because it wouldn't be meaningful. It wouldn't be meaningful, we wouldn't get anything done, and then people wouldn't be aware of the work that had taken place because we would only have three representatives. Because I, I think that speaks to the consistency and academic rigor and the different personalities at the school, if the schools at the middle school level. If we're not moving forward as a district together and having buy-in from all three middle schools with the majority of the ELA teachers. Um, you'll have pockets of success and then you'll have more of the same results we've been seeing for the last four or five or actually I think it goes back further than that. I think it's been a downward trend for even further back. Um, I, d I, I definitely like hear what that. you're saying. I hear you. I mean, again, you know, I'm the elementary person, but this is where my heart is. This is what I taught for many years, and this is what I know. So I, if we're going to move forward with this, I definitely want it to be successful. So thank you. All right. Um, do I have any more questions? No? All right. So we'd be looking for a motion to approve the contract with TLA in the amount not to exceed $96,800. So moved. All right, uh, I will second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Okay. So, um, TLA feedback, oh, historical result, that was all one, you've combined it, nicely done. All right, um, so I guess, um, is there anything else you'd like to add this evening, Ms. Sarfati, Dr. Sarfati? No, thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Any comments from the? I have a question, actually. Um, I mentioned to you, um, I don't know, like a couple months ago, about whether there was going to be any professional development for um, social studies and history teachers, and I didn't know if that was something you'd made any progress on. Yeah, yes. Um, Dr. McKinney and I are working very hard on that, specifically for the specifically for the secondary social studies folks, absolutely. And I, I will also say that um, I've been in contact with the secondary um, social studies teachers and all of our AP teachers as well, and um, they are definitely advocating for themselves with regard to having updated materials, and that's something that we're working very hard to get for them. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, I guess I'd be looking for a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. All right. Motion by Ms. Lamphier, seconded by Mr. Claffey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we are adjourned at 8.01. Thank you very much.